What happens when we lose these these uh, local news sites, um, these operations? You know, th there's a lot of trust involved with these local um, organizations. I, I wanted to just tap on to what Joshua said um, because you know. The reporters tend to live in the communities. They're not some remote uh, Washington-based, um, you know, uh, figure that's so easy that's easy to hate, you know, because they live right there in their in their own communities. Um, we we've heard about the rise of polarization. There's more corruption. There's uh, apathy. People vote less. But I'm also really concerned about what replaces, uh, what fills the void, which is like. Twitter trolls and propaganda and you know misinformation and uh, you know conspiracy theories and um, so I think that as we s applaud uh, these local initiatives um, that are coming up now, we have to also be really vigilant. Excellent. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, to the uh, 2022 Masterman Lecture Series. And I'm um, happy to welcome both those of you here in person and those of you streaming this um, online um, and via the WGBH forum. So that Masterman Lecture Series was set up in 1950, I'm uh, sorry, set up by a 1950 graduate of Suffolk University Law School, Edward Masterman, um, and his wife, Seidel, who established the speaker series on the First Amendment and the Fourth Estate to provide a forum for robust debate and exchange of ideas on the freedom of the press and its attendant responsibilities. This year, we're delighted to welcome an esteemed panel of speakers to speak on a particularly timely set of issues, the decline of local news and its relationship to the rise of polarization. Uh, Ed Masterman had hoped to join us today, uh, but unfortunately was unable to do so at the last moment. So in his place, we are happy to welcome Ed's son, Jim, who will share some brief remarks on behalf of the family. Well, thank you very much. I'm used to getting applause that was intended for my father. Um, Dean, thank you very much for hosting. Thank you very much for having us. Um, I'm sorry that my father couldn't be here, my mother as well. He is 96 plus years old, but in the fit of health. My mother is much, much younger. And since I'm being recorded, I said that intentionally. <laughs> Suffolk Law School since 1950 has been extremely important to my father. He takes great pride in having uh, graduated Suffolk Law School. He's been loyal to the school for many, many years. He attributes, he was a GI Bill person who came out of World War II and went to Suffolk undergrad and Suffolk Law School and attributes his success, and he's had significant success as a lawyer for many, many years directly to Suffolk Law School. So we're really thrilled to be able to be part of the community, to have this speaker series named in his stead. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to say hello on, on my family's behalf, and I hope, and I think you will, get a lot out of the speakers, because the one thing my dad likes to do now more than anything is read the New York Times from cover to cover. And that's his great joy. He's always liked the newspaper industry, believes in the, in the, in the significance of the journalism, believes in the investigative press, and would have been thrilled to be here to enjoy this, and so I hope that you do as well. Thank you very much. So we're delighted today to have with us four speakers who uh, bring with them a wealth of experience and study related to the issues uh, of local journalism. Joshua Dar is a professor of political communication in the Manship School of Mass Communications and a professor in the Department of Political Science at Louisiana State University. He's also the co-author of a 2021 book, Homestyle Opinion, How Local Newspapers Can Slow Polarization. Renee Loth is a longtime political reporter and served as editor of the Boston Globe's editorial page. And she continues to write columns for the Globe and serves as a lecturer in public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Charles St. Amand is a practitioner in residence here at Suffolk University in the Communications and Journalism Department. A graduate of Suffolk University, he worked for many years in community journalism, including as editor of Fitchburg's Sentinel and Enterprise. And last but not least, we're happy to have here Dan Kennedy of Northeastern School of Journalism serving as our moderator. 
Dan writes and speaks extensively on journalism generally and on local journalism in particular, including a forthcoming book with Ellen Clegg, who's also in our audience, uh, entitled What Works? The Future of Local News. And so I'm now going to hand it over to Dan to start our program. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you to all of you for coming out uh, to listen to our discussion of this really important topic. Um, I promise the next hour and a half will be a lively one. I want to welcome you to this discussion of the future of the state of community journalism. Now, the title of this program tonight is pretty depressing, the decline of local news and the rise of polarization. And there are, in fact, plenty of reasons to be pessimistic. According to researcher Penny Abernathy of Northwestern University, some 2,500 newspapers, about a quarter of the total across the country, have shut down since 2005. More than a fifth of Americans live in news deserts that lack the reliable journalism they need to govern themselves in a democracy. Many of the newspapers that continue to publish could be called ghost papers, with so few staff members that they have little or no ability to cover the communities that they purportedly serve. The effects of this are clear. According to mounds of academic research, the decline of local news correlates with lower voter turnout, fewer candidates running for public office, and even higher municipal borrowing costs as lenders charge what might be referred to as a corruption tax, since they know that there are no independent watchdogs to keep an eye on waste and abuse. So what happened? Essentially, the internet came along and blew apart the business model that paid for journalism. Until the past decade or so, advertising accounted for about 80% of newspaper revenues. Craigslist destroyed the highly lucrative classified ad business by offering most of its services for free. Google and Facebook took most of the rest. As a result, even newspapers that were forward-looking in trying to reinvent themselves in the digital space found it was difficult, if not impossible, to bring in the revenues that they needed. But there's another important part to this story that doesn't always get told. And that's the role that corporate greed has played in undermining the newspaper business. Giant newspaper chains owned by the likes of Gannett and Alden Global Capital have sucked whatever remaining profits they can out of the newspapers they own by laying off journalists and selling off real estate. Rather than investing, I'm sorry, rather than investing in news coverage that people might be willing to pay for, they've taken an approach that economists refer to as harvesting, taking whatever revenues they can out of their newspapers until there's nothing left, after which they shut them down or sell them off. Those of us who live in Massachusetts can see what Gannett has been doing this year, closing weekly newspapers and assigning most of their weekly reporters to regional beats. What's happening in Massachusetts is not unique. Fortunately, there are alternatives to this sad story. Hundreds of news organizations, many of them new, are rising to fill the gap. Many are digital nonprofits. Some are for profits. Some of them even still offer print. Some are thriving. Others are just getting by. My research partner, Ellen Clegg, and I have been traveling across the country to tell the stories of these news organizations, from tiny digital projects like the Mendocino Voice in Northern California to legacy print newspapers like the Storm Lake Times Pilot in Iowa to MLK 50, which covers social justice issues in Memphis, Tennessee. Our project is called What Works? The Future of Local News and shameless plug, you can listen to our podcast at whatworks.news. Our book is scheduled to be published in early 2024. Now, there's no substitute for on the ground entrepreneurship, but there are other ideas afoot as well. Federal legislation has been proposed to make it easier for newspapers to band together to negotiate with Google and Facebook in order to obtain a slice of their adver advertising revenues, some of which comes from repurposing 
newspaper journalism. Another bill would create a series of tax credits for subscribers, advertisers, and publishers. Journalists are rightly wary of government assistance, lest it compromise their independence. But at the very least, we are living at a time when some new thinking is needed. We're also living at a time when many Americans are highly engaged with national news, and especially with the divisive talk shows that are carried on cable news outlets. At a time like this, local journalism can be a way to bring us together. We all want quality schools, a police department that keeps us safe while respecting individual rights, and a health system that serves everyone. And yes, even these issues have gotten caught up in the ugly rhetoric driven by the national blue-red divide. But community journalism at its best can be a way to bring people of different viewpoints together so they work toward common goals. The challenge is to find ways of providing such journalism at a time when technological, economic, and social forces make that more difficult than ever. We have a great panel, and I know you're all eager to hear their thoughts. After each of them has delivered some opening remarks, I'll ask them a few questions and then open it up to you. Thank you for all for coming, and I hope you find our conversation enlightening. Our first speaker is Joshua Dar from Louisiana State University. Thank you, Dan. Um, excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, I am going to uh, take, I guess, a little privilege as the political scientist on the panel to talk about the second half of the title of the of the uh, of the the panel today, which is polarization, which you've no doubt heard about, and you may have heard about in the context it is normally talked about, which is kind of just as a catch-all for everything people think is wrong with politics. <laughs> there's, a, there's a sense in which the discourse around polarization, which is extensive, has gotten away from the definitions of it as academics have tried to study it, and, and really what it means at its core, which means things are at two poles. They're distant, right? They're far from each other, um, like the North Pole and the South Pole. And so, Amer the American political parties have gotten further apart from each other on any number of different measures. And I think just before a discussion about polarization, it's important to sort of define some of what that is. Um, that could mean ideologically, policy prescriptions for important problems. That could mean what political scientists who are, honestly, we're quite bad at naming things, uh, call affective polarization, which is really just whether or not you like people on the other side. Um, I'm still trying to think of a better name for that. Um, and then uh, the, one, the one technical survey note I'll, I'll, I'll do, because I think it helps describe what it is, something called social polarization, which is measured in surveys by the question, how would you feel if your child married a member of the opposing party? Which I think kind of gets at it nicely. Um, so these, these forms of polarization are all on the rise, uh, as, as the title notes, that people are getting further apart from each other when it comes to politics. And at the same time as this polarization trend is happening, as, as Dan's remarks noted, there is also a nationalization of American politics. And these are, these are very much related to each other. All politics is local is on the way out a little bit uh, when it comes to some of these local races that are determined by how you feel about President Trump or how you feel about the national discourse on a certain topic of schools or abortion rights or, or any number of things that are important issues that catch people's attention but may not be what's actually at stake with the policies made by those offices. Um, and a lot of focus has been, has been put on partisan media, a lot of focus has been port, uh, put on to uh, misinformation and disinformation. Certainly social media has added a lot to the media environment, but as this panel notes and as my research has, has focused on, We've also subtracted quite a bit from the media environment at the same time that we've added all of these things. And we've subtracted the local. Now, now why does that matter? Um, in 2018, we published a paper uh, called Newspaper Closures Polarized Voting Behavior, which I, I think is one of my more straightforward titles. Um, but it is, uh, we measured where newspapers had closed and, uh, and looked at 
straight ticket voting versus split ticket voting. So do you vote for multiple parties on the same ballot or the same party all the way down? Something that was described in a, a political science article from the 1950s as a, a privilege almost unique to Americans, that we, that we would even do this. Um, we discovered that straight ticket voting increased or split ticket voting went down, however you want to look at it, when a newspaper closed. Um, interestingly, we found this wasn't really about information. This was more about uh, people substituting national uh, for, for local. And what happens when you read national news is you read about partisan conflict. They are one and the same. And that reinforces divisions. It reinforces partisan identity. And you start to think like a partisan when you walk into the ballot box for any race at all. Um, the reason that this is important is that local identity has the potential to be a cross-cutting identity. It, 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 local issues have the potential to cut across national issues. Where, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows, but local issues make strange alliances. And it is possible for uh, people who might be disagreeing uh, in a partisan way to agree on a local issue or disagree on a local issue. And I don't mean to suggest that there's not a lot of conflict in local politics, because there absolutely is. It just does not always fall neatly along partisan lines the way many other identity-driven aspects of American politics today tend to fall uh, within, within those partisan lines. Um, so the first study that I mentioned uh, inspired a second one where a newspaper read what we did and decided we're just going to drop national politics from our opinion page for an entire month. Uh, and we saw this and jumped into action and decided to measure it. And we found that in a local newspaper, the Desert Sun in Palm Springs, California, um, where I was supposed to go in March 2020, so I've never been. And I have written a book about a place I've never been now, which is probably bad journalistic practice. But you know what? COVID did it. Um, we found that you know a full third to a half of the opinion page was about Donald Trump in 2019, July 2019 in, again, Southern California. Um, we found that when they, when they got rid of national coverage, their mentions of parties went down from just either party from 25% of articles to 10. Uh, and people were reading more, much more about Palm Springs and California issues and far less about the national parties that were happening literally 3,000 miles away in Washington, DC. So we found through, these, through some surveys that sort of confirming what we saw in the newspaper closures, Polarization slows when newspapers become more local. So to the point of being optimistic, maybe, it's not all about things becoming less local. They can still become more, and the same thing happens when they become more local, um, which is that polarization um, slows down in that way. So again, there's no easy solution uh, to, to a lot of what's going on in politics today. Uh, the divisions that are that are that define what we do and define how we see each other are, are national in, in, in nature and are more ubiquitous than ever. It's so easy to get national news. It's just everywhere. It's a lot harder to get local news. Um, national is a, is a part of the problem, and I think it's important to start seeing it that way. Um, it, to the point of this panel and to the point of solutions and what works, um, we should be rethinking the composition and the balance of local news. How much national news belongs in a local news product uh, when there is so much marketplace for, for national news? How can local news differentiate itself and make some money in the uh, and make some money as well and, and survive? Because ultimately what the newspaper closures paper shows is we need local newspapers to survive. Our politics is better for it. Thank you. Speaking next will be Renee Loth, uh, the retired editorial page editor of the Boston Globe and uh, continues to be a working journalist. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I guess my role here is to offer you a couple of glimmers of hope, um, and I will be doing that. But I also wanted to highlight some of the extraordinary local reporting that is going on in, in this country against these extraordinary odds that, that we've heard about. Um, because I think it just gives you an idea of, of how much really there is at stake and how much we have to lose um, if we lose these local news outlets. 
Um, you know, in, in Clarion, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, there's a, a paper called the Clarion Ledger, circulation 15,000, not very big. And they have been on top of that city's water crisis and, um, uh, you know, crumbling infrastructure, water infrastructure, long before it became a national story, four years. Um, and they, you know, have chronicled the problems. And you may, you may know that in Jackson, Mississippi now, there's 150,000, a city of 150,000, mostly poor, mostly black residents who do not have safe drinking water. What, what was striking to me um, in reading the coverage is that recently, I think it was even this just this week, um, as a, um, a boil water order was lifted, um, saying, you know, okay, it's safe to, to drink your water again. The, that little paper hired their own independent engineering firm to help um, test the water um, and to, you know, monitor the quality of the water because that paper is more trusted in that community than, than the government. Um, another example um, I read about recently uh, is in uh, West Virginia, where I'm not sure I could get the thing, the Mountain State Spotlight, it's called. Um, they teamed up with ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative journalism outfit, um, to uh, write a really searing investigative series on the um, foster care system in that state, in which they found that the government's over-reliance on out-of-state group homes left many children in unsafe and abusive um, situations. And what was striking to me about that story is that the reporters in the project were all under 35. So there is, there is a future. Um, you know, here in Massachusetts, closer to home, there's uh, an outfit now called the New Bedford Light, which is a free nonprofit digital news site started by local philanthropists um, who just um, uh, this year detailed, well, they just started last year, and they detailed how private equity firms and foreign investments are. Uh, basically taking over the New England fishing industry, um, which is so important to the people who live in, in New Bedford. And, um, you know, forcing down prices and, you know, depressing incomes and forcing many of the local fishermen to sell or lease their um, permit rights to these giant conglomerates. Okay, so, you know, would any of these important stories be told if, in those communities, if we didn't have the local news outlets no i mean because the national public publications don't you know they, they don't care or they wait until it gets to be a crisis like in in clarion um, in in uh, jackson mississippi where the clarion ledger had been following it for years um i, I think um you know we, we heard about the um okay so now i'm going to go to the glimmers of hope um we heard about the uh the collapse of the business model for, for newspapers, which for decades, centuries, have depended, had depended on advertising for the revenue. Um, when that collapsed, um, you know, there, there were several years of just despair, <laughs> I don't mind saying. Um, and then uh, a number of sort of public-spirited individuals started coming forward, like at the New Bedford Light, uh, many of them former journalists who were either retired or laid off um, when, when the traditional newspapers began declining. Um, and they, they started up these, these local uh, news sites. Um, I know of, of one actual physical paper in Ipswich, Massachusetts. There's another one that's starting up in Concord. Um, there's a number of, of these efforts that are, that are going on now. Um, there's a similar, kind of similar model in um, Colorado. It's called the Colorado Sun. Uh, started by a group of um, like the top reporters at the of the Denver Post who quit when, um, as Dan was saying, uh, the the evil Alden Capital um, bought that paper. Uh, they're notorious for strip mining their properties for profit, um, and so these fellows and women just left um, and started up this this Denver Post. Um, it's a little bit of a twist because it is a for profit. Uh, operation, but it's organized as something called a public benefit corporation. So they don't have to enrich their owners. They can re, uh, reinvest uh, their profits into, into the news operation. Um, they remind me a little bit of a public radio station in that they survive on um, you know, philanthropy, but also memberships and tickets to events, you know, and, and exclusive newsletter subscriptions and sponsorships, a little bit like the, the public radio model. 
Um, you know, even the Boston Globe has dipped its toe a little bit into this arena um, with uh, using uh, the journalistic reporting legwork of Northeastern University students, journalism students, um, overseen by the grizzled veterans of, of the Boston Globe, the older editors, but using the, the energy, really, of the uh, students to help uh, their reporting. And also, there's even one uh, arts reporter at the Globe whose salary is subsidized um, partly by a number of arts um, foundations, uh, but they're not from uh, this area. They're, they're from California. Um, OK, so we're in this experimental mode now, it feels like, um, where you just like throw all the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, I, I, you know, and, and I'm hopeful that, that some of these models is we're in kind of a shakedown cruise. I can mix the metaphors. Um, I think the, that some of these models will, will be successful. Um, I, I, I just want to point of personal privilege, say that not all of this is new. Um, my very first job in journalism was as editor of something called the East Boston Community News, which was a free, nonprofit, weekly newspaper, community-driven newspaper, all volunteer staff. Um, and it was organized as a 501c3 corporation so it could get grants and um, you know, uh, uh, tax-deductible donations. Um, and, but that newspaper published for 19 years on that model, um, covering all kinds of important issues over there in East Boston, particularly around the airport and its expansion, but not exclusively school committee meetings, you know, um, community efforts to clean up a, a dirty abandoned lot, you know, really super hyper local stuff for 19 years. So my point there is that, you know, it can be done. Um, okay, so close. Close parentheses. <laughs> um, and you know, as Dan said, we even for a minute looked like we might be getting some support from the unlikely source of Congress um, that that um, uh, local journalism sustainability act, as it was called, did garner support from both parties. Um, it was going to be a series of small tax breaks for um, people who took out ads in local papers or uh, some small subsidies for reporter salaries. Um, and it got rolled into the uh, President Biden's Build Back Better law, that, but it didn't survive the negotiations that ended up with the much more slimmed down version of the, the bill that became law. Um, you know, we, we, so what happens when we lose these, these uh, local news sites, um, these operations? You know, th there's a lot of trust involved with these local um, organizations I, I wanted to just tap on to what Joshua said, um, because, you know, the reporters tend to live in the communities. They're not some remote uh, Washington-based, um, you know, uh, figure that's so easy, that's easy to hate, you know, because they live right there in their, in their own communities. Um, we, we've heard about the rise of polarization. There's more corruption. There's uh, apathy. People vote less. But I'm also really concerned about what replaces, uh, what fills the void, which is like Twitter trolls and propaganda and you know misinformation and uh, you know conspiracy theories and um, so I think that as we s applaud uh, these local initiatives um, that are coming up now, we have to also be really vigilant about something that I have to get his name right because. It's so brilliant. Um, <laughs> something that uh, there's a reporter in Alabama named Ryan Zickraft. Um, we have to be careful about what he has coined uh, pink slime journalism. <clears throat> okay, so just like the pink slime that fast food companies were supposedly like slipping into their hamburgers, pink slime journalism masquerades as real news, as legitimate news, but actually these sites, you know, you dig a little bit and you see that they are just, you know, press release factories for individual, um, you know, politicians mostly. Um, so we just have to be extra vigilant that, that pink slime, which is particularly galling to me because um, it exploits that trust that, that people have in their local press mm -hmm. and undermines the legitimacy of, of everybody else. So watch out for pink slime. Um, I, and I just think that we need to uh, support all of these efforts uh, to replace the, the void that are legitimate because you know, the stakes are just too high if they don't succeed. Sit down. Thanks. Charles. Thank you.
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. Our, our third speaker is Charles St. Amand, uh, who teaches in the journalism program here at Suffolk and is a veteran uh, journalist in the greater Boston area with stops at the Lowell Sun, the Fitchburg Sentinel and Enterprise, and the Boston Herald. Uh, all of which are now owned by Alden Global Capital. Whoa. So um, Charlie has a really interesting perspective on all this. <laughs> yeah, and, and then Renee just killed it for me for <laughs> eating hamburgers ever again. I forgot all about pink slime. You had to remind me of it. Um, my, my story here is very personal. Um, I loved working in community journalism. I really did. Um, I didn't know how much I loved it until she broke up with me mm -hmm. um, on November 2nd, 2017. I don't know why I, I can remember that date. Um, it's dramatic. Because, yeah, it was a big thing. And um, I was then the editor of the Sentinel and Enterprise. I had worked at, I started the Patriot Ledger after I, I, I got an internship through Suffolk when I was a student. Uh, I worked an internship at the Patriot Ledger. They hired me right out of school, like the, yeah, I think, you know, we, had, we graduated on a Sunday. I think I was working on a Monday or a week week after that. Um, from there, I went to, I worked in my hometown paper, which was great, for almost three years. And then I had an opportunity to work at the Lowell Sun. I worked at the Sun. I was the news editor. I was 24 years old. I had no business being the news editor. And, um, but, you know, I learned. I made a lot of mistakes. I learned a lot. Met, worked with some great people at all these newspapers. And uh, I worked my, I was the news editor, I, I was the city editor, um, I was the, I was the, uh, I don't know, ex night editor, I was the executive news editor, there was nothing executive about it, nothing. <laughs> um, I was the managing editor, uh, the number two position um, in the newsroom, and uh, I was promoted to editor of the, the smaller daily uh, by then, we were owned by Media News Group. We were owned by, um, we were owned by a company that was known as a cost cutter, um, um, and but it hadn't been taken over by uh, Alden Global Capital just yet. A couple of years later, it would be, and um, and I'll tell you, I I was I thought I would be the last one out of the newsroom. I I thought I was going to be the last man standing. I would be turning out the lights and my publisher gave me a call one afternoon. Uh, he was in Lowell, they had, they had, I had had two publishers in, in uh, Fitchburg, but they eventually, they were having trouble. They were going through publishers like, you know, I go through socks and um, he, um, so the publisher just decided, I'm gonna be publisher of both, both nameplates, both the Sun and the Sentinel and Enterprise. So, um, um, and then he lost his job in a, in a corporate consolidation. So I had a new publisher. He called me one afternoon. He says, Charlie, I'm heading over uh, to talk to you. And I said, oh, oh, wow. You know, like he didn't, you know, it wasn't a planned meeting or anything like that. He'd only come to the paper a couple of times. Um, and I got off the phone and I realized I'm going to be, I'm going to get fired. I'm losing my job. Um, and that's exactly what happened. I was laid off. He said, your performance has nothing to do with it. So that's when she broke up with me. Um, and I don't think I'm over her yet because I still dream about being in the newsroom three nights a week, okay? So, um, and if she called me back, I probably go back. Um, and I want to say that this is not the newsroom's fault, this decline of local news. It's not the newsroom's fault. Um, no one ever walked up to me in the newsroom, one of my colleagues, and said, you know, we have too many people in this newsroom, you know? No one ever said that, you know? And I know, yeah, you're right. Let's get rid of, and, you know, slowly, you know, they say if you, th you know, and I don't think this is true, maybe there's some scientists up here at Suffolk can tell me, um, uh, if you throw a frog into boiling water, it'll jump out. 
but if you put it in and you just slowly turn, it doesn't notice, it doesn't know to jump out. And we didn't know to jump out. I didn't know to jump out. And I didn't want to jump out. Um, I wanted, but they were cutting and cutting and cutting. And it, and it got to a point where you, you think, um, well, this is it. This, this, there can't be any more after this one, you know. And this is every newsroom. The Globe, the folks at the Globe can tell you they're leaner than they were, you know. I think um, the New York Times um, is doing great, and, and I, I, I love the fact that uh, there are some papers doing well. Um, but we did a lot of cool things. We, 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 you know, this seismic shift to digital made us change our print product. We, were, we, were, we would put a, a pretty good sampling of national news out front, and we went totally local with our front pages because that was our niche. That was what people got us for. So we had, and, and, but the problem was as we got fewer and fewer uh, staff members to cover our communities, um, and it wasn't, you know, the, the Fitchburg Sentinel and Enterprise didn't just cover Fitchburg and Lemster, it covered another seven communities around it. The Lowell Sun, more than a dozen communities. Um, so, so our focus had to narrow and narrow. And, you know, when I was the city editor in, in Lowell, um, we had 50 FTEs in the newsroom, full-time equivalents. And uh, there were still too many stories uh, and not enough reporters for them. So, you know, it's always been, you know, you have to make decisions. And that's why, you know, I like to make those decisions. I like to figure those things out. And it got harder. And sometimes you'd have two stories and one reporter. And then it became you had three stories and one reporter. Um, and then, you know, you're, you're making really difficult choices about what to cover. You know, you can't do more with less. We, we, were, we were told to do more with less, but you just can't do it. And... Um, but I don't want to give you all bad news um, because I don't want to be just such a Debbie Downer. Um, the, I, am, I, I spoke to two people who I, whom I would describe today as the happiest, the two happiest editors in Massachusetts, okay? One of them is Kevin Moran. He's the executive editor of the uh, Berkshire Eagle. Uh, the Berkshire Eagle um, was part of Media News Group. Uh, Kevin was a, a colleague of sorts, and we would meet at various meetings and things like that. And, uh, and then when Alden Global Capital came in uh, and really started to trim newspapers right down to the bone and selling off properties, things like that, um, um, a judge, uh, Fred Rutberg, out, who was a retired judge in, um, in Massachusetts, he had... Um, he had, he would have stayed working as a judge, I, I've learned, but at 70, he was, he was forced uh, to retire under Massachusetts law if you're a judge, I guess. Is that true? Yes. Okay. I don't want to be giving you bad stuff. And, uh, and, and Fred just got sick and tired of seeing the Berkshire Eagle, which had won a Pulitzer Prize back in the day. And, uh, you know, maybe it said it somewhere on its masthead. Um, he got sick of seeing his newspaper disappear. Um, and it was, he was afraid. It was becoming one of those ghost newspapers. And he was able to get a group together to buy, to give Alden Global Capital enough money to bring that paper back into local ownership. And that was five years ago. And you know, I, every once in a while, I'll call Kevin saying, how's, how's it going? Because when it first happened, it was great. It was great. And Kevin, uh, I remember he, he was recalling the closing, because I, I called him. I said, how, how does it feel, you know? And he said, I, I talked to one of the representatives from Alden Global Capital, and Alden Global Capital said, the only thing I care about is bringing money back to our investors. Mm. That's the only thing that is on my mind. He didn't say... Oh, we're going to keep these papers going. You know, like this, there was that was what that person said. I don't know who the executive was, but that's that was that was what he had to say. Whether he spoke for the entire company, I'm not sure. But uh, I can say that five years later, 
and I, I saw him a few years ago because I did a workshop in his newsroom um, on you know being your own copy editor kind of thing. But he's hired copy editors. He's been able to move some people from lifestyle, and now he's, he's got digital. Um, he's got a digital content. Folks are who are really focused on digital. They have they have um, um, just in their most recent numbers. They have seven thousand digital only subscribers. Okay, in addition to the ones that when you get the paper, you get digital. You know, with the with with the paper. So. Um, so, and he said, we're, we're doing one, well, and they have also started a nonprofit arm um, so that, um, that people can donate toward, and, and the, the whole point of it is to do, to fund positions in the newsroom to cover areas and people that they are not covering currently. So that is, you know. I, got a, I felt great getting off the phone with Kevin, Kevin Moran. The next person I talked to was uh, Jen Paluzzi. Uh, <laughs> Jen Paluzzi um, was, I was trying to get it out of Dan, but he wouldn't tell us when we met on Zoom. Uh, he, had, he had found it out, but I, and so I said, I mentioned that, and, and, and he said, well, I, Jen said, I told, I told Dan, uh, you know. And, and but she I told him, swore me to secrecy yes, for a yes, while. Yes, yes, so, um, so I called her up. I said, I want to I hear about this, this uh, venture, you know? And this is, again, people in the community saying we're fed up. Uh, the, the paper, the Concord Journal, which I believe is owned by Gannett now, yes. uh, is, um, you know, has be, is no longer, it's a reg more of a regional um, um, publication. So it's not focused like a laser on Concord. And there's a lot of content in it that, you know, the people of Concord wanted want local local news, so a, a group, you know, got together and said we're going to create this this thing, and and it's another tweak to the business model, and hopefully it hopefully it works. I pray that it does. She's been told by her board, you're only all we want you to do is put out a good newspaper, and uh, and I said well, um, th that, but I said well. Th their resolve will be tested, you know, by the community because they'll call the board and they'll say, you know, don't be surprised if you hear from somebody, okay? But so far, so good. They're three weeks away from launch. Um, they gave us a nice shout out on uh, about this panel um, um, on Twitter, and so I I, I don't want to say it's it's all bad news, but. You know, uh, the Sentinel and Enterprise, the Little Sun, they've really become, and they, they were hardworking journalists in, the, in their newsrooms, okay? I know, um, I know a few of them uh, that are working in Lowell, um, and they're working, they're just, you know, maybe they're the last ones out, but, you know, I hope that, um, I hope there's recovery there. I hope something happens, like, but, um, but it's it's. I'm sorry, I got emotional. I I just uh, I did it for 31 years. We did it well, so so that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Now, what we're going to do? I don't know what I'm doing, but I think the frogs are boiling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I'll just, I'll just plow ahead. This, this <laughs> boiling frog will continue to speak. Um, what we're going to do now is I have a question for each of our panelists, um, but all of you should feel free to jump in. Mm -hmm. I was watching a panel recently, and I like what the moderator said. He said, the polite part of the program is now over. <laughs> so uh, feel free to uh, jump ugly with each other. Uh, but I'd like to start off by asking you, Josh, a question. You know, when you look at small weekly papers, community websites, things like that, it's totally appropriate for there to be nothing in there except local news. But when you move up a level to a regional daily newspaper, I think the ethic of those papers has always been, we're going to provide a complete report. We're going to have to rely on wire services to do a lot of it, but we're going to supply a complete report, local, regional, 
national, international. And our opinion pages are going to reflect that. There's going to be some local opinion, and there's going to be nationally syndicated columnists, and we're going to try to balance it with liberals and conservatives. And that's always been the mission. And um, you seem to be making an argument that that mission no longer works. And, and yet, one, one other point before I turn it over to you, I, I think we all understand that the vast majority of people will, if we are lucky, subscribe to one newspaper. So that paper really has to be comprehensive. You seem to be saying we need to move away from that. Yes, revolutionize the model. Um, no, I think that uh, it's it's a good point, and it's it's one that the anybody trying to to work in this space has to think about. That newspapers really do think of themselves as like it lands on your doorstep, and and then that you've got what you need. Um, I think that that is a bit of a market strategy that does not reflect how the competition has changed, because the competition is that what works online is what doesn't have distribution costs. Uh, and, and national politics applies to everyone in a way that no local politics simply cannot. Um, this is where in institutional theories of the presidency, right, the president um, is powerful in part because the entire country votes on one office and that's the president. Um, you can see this in, in how national news is, is, is marketed. Um, and I, I do have my doubts about national syndicated opinion columnists in a, in a local newspaper. And I realize it's a, it's a bit of a, a different sort of thing, but I fundamentally think people can get national opinion coverage just about anywhere, including the, the talk shows that you mentioned in your, in your opening remarks. And that was not always the case, right? There was, there was a half hour where all three channels had news on that was national news. And the rest of it was either local or what arrived in your newspaper. And national politics is sort of inherently divisive these days around partisan identity. And the reason that that's diff that that is important is that all these other identities sit under that partisan identity of um, what kind of car you drive and what religion you are and what, um, what, what even what your job is. You know the the mm -hmm. the the umbrella identity when it comes to political news and political thought is party. And um, party ID is sort of the most fundamental variable in the study of public opinion, for better or for worse. We call it the unmoved mover, which means that it moves everything else, but it's very difficult itself to move. Um, and so I think that in a polarized politics where there is essentially very low distribution cost of national politics, if the newspaper is a peril of sort of a pale reflection of what you could get from a national newspaper that you can subscribe to for almost, you know, for somewhat affordable rate for a digital only subscription and you don't have to worry about whether it's going to be printed and dropped at your doorstep, um, you might just do that. You might just, you know, the New York Times is, is blowing out its opinion page. It's hiring more and more people for its opinion page. They know that the opinion page is what drives uh, clicks and people to their website and starts the debates that end up on the talk shows at night. Um, and so I just question the value of it given the flattening of those distribution costs. And I, re I recognize that it's tough uh, to, to rethink a model, but if you don't rethink your model, the model rethinks you. Mm. You know, I, I would just, you know, echo that and, and remind people that, you know, these, these small local newspapers are fighting for the attention of, of people who are, have, you know, many, many places to go for their news. And you want to be distinctive. You know, you want to have something that, that you have that nobody else has. I mean, you can read, you know, Tom Friedman or Paul Krugman or whoever. Uh, in many places now. And even when I was editor of the editorial page of the Globe, which is now going back, you know, 10, more than 10 years, we eliminated all of the national syndicated columnists from the op-ed page, um, you know, with David Broder and all of those guys, sorry. It was inexpensive to run them because it was just a little syndication fee. 
and they were popular, but I could see that you, you, you could read David Broder anywhere. And I wanted our page to be distinctive and have voices that you could only find in the Boston Globe. And so, you know, we just eliminated all of these, these folks. And I think it's, I think it's a better page um, for it. So you want to distinguish yourself. Okay, Renee, let me ask you a question. Yes. Um, I want to draw on your long experience at the Boston Globe. Uh, since we're talking about business models here. Uh, the Globe, as we know, has been remarkably successful in recent years at rejuvenating its business model. It's largely built on charging a lot of money for digital subscriptions. And, and they've been successful at that, and God bless them. Uh, they, they, are, they had announced they were profitable before the pandemic. I assume they're still profitable, although they haven't spoken about that for a while. They're growing, they're hiring people. Uh, what I want to ask you is this, do you have the fear that Boston may just be the last great news town? <laughs> and that what the Globe has managed to accomplish, and maybe a few others like the Star Tribune in Minneapolis and a couple of others, really is not generally replicable. Yeah. Maybe it's like baseball, still very popular in Boston, despite the Red Sox best efforts to turn us away from it, <laughs> um, but not so popular elsewhere in the country. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a big chauvinist for Boston. I love, love Boston. I moved here when I was 17 to go to college and imprinted on this city, you know, and I've never looked back. So not only are we um, a great news town, we have two newspapers, two daily newspapers and two public radio stations. Um, and it's an extraordinary and, you know, perhaps unique in, in, the, in the country. So yes, I think that it's, um, you know, we have a lot to be proud of here. I do worry that um, other markets are not having the success that that the globe has, and not only are they doing this, are they bringing in revenue uh, on the digital subscription? But I'm one of those old-fashioned people who still gets the physical paper every day, and I believe that the Boston Globe is the most expensive home-delivered newspaper in the country. It is um, massively expensive. It's massively expensive. It is a tax deduction for somebody who's in the business. So, um, but. Uh, it, it's really expensive, and uh, you know, I just I'm just loyal, and, and yeah. I love the. I, I I have to say that I think the digital experience is just different than reading a physical paper, and um, I think it's not you don't read as deeply, and I, I just prefer the physical paper. So, but it is wicked expensive, um, and <laughs> this is a community, though Boston, that's willing to pay for that. Um, they're willing to pay for news. They recognize yeah. the importance of of local news, the, it's a very civically uh, engaged, um, you know, community, very, uh, you know, well-educated, relatively wealthy community, and I think all of that plays into making Boston a great newspaper town. I will say that when we were talking about some of these small startups, um, uh, even locally, yeah, my, my one concern is that they're in communities, Concord, Ipswich, you know, uh, the Berkshires, that are wealthy communities, yeah. um, communities that can tap into uh, philanthropy and so on. And, you know, so these, these great successes are not necessarily in the places that need them most. Um, so that's something that I just wanted to throw in there as a concern. Thank you, Renee. And uh, Josh, you wanted to jump in? I just wanted to say, this, is, this, theor this theory of who pays for newspapers and where the successful ones are is detailed in, and I'll just plug the book because I think the title wraps it up nicely. Nikki Usher of the University of San Diego wrote a book last year called News for the Rich, White, and Blue. Yeah. And uh, wow. sort, of predi <laughs> sort of predicts that you're going to have successful newspapers in places with rich, white Democrats, and Boston is succeeding in that, res in that regard. <laughs> Charlie, Who are you, were you about to say? I just realized that I need a book deal. I, you know, I, that's, that's all. <laughs> OK. Okay, I, I must say there are some fantastic digital news sites out there that are serving less than affluent communities. And Renee mentioned New Bedford Light. Uh, one of my favorites is the New Haven Independent. So it's not universal. But certainly, you have stolen some of my thunder, Renee, from my question to Charlie, which is 
um, you know, we're, as Renee mentioned, we're talking about a lot of really vibrant digital startups. Some of them are already publishing. Some of them are getting ready to publish. Not just New Bedford, but Bedford, Concord, Lexington, uh, Brookline is looking at something. Marblehead has two, uh, which is just absolutely remarkable. But most of these are in very affluent communities. Now, given your experience, uh, Charlie, in Lowell and Fitchburg, do you have any thoughts on how to bring this type of project to areas that face more economic challenges than some of the really affluent suburbs? Well, it's funny you ask, because when I was laid off, I sent a note to the son of the richest person I knew in the uh, fitchburg Leminster area, and I said, hey, how about it? You know, you, you buy the paper and bring it back. You know, I said, they're, they're doing this out in, out in, uh, out and, and I never got, I didn't get a reply, so. But there, are, you know, I think it's gonna have to be more grassroots. It's gonna have to be, you know, and it might bring people together in a way. And, and I wanna say this about Lowell. Um, Lowell politics is brutal, okay? It was brutal. It, you know, they, they have the, uh, you know, on, on Tuesday nights, on Tuesday, Monday and, Monday night, they'd have the Golden Gloves, you know, in the, in, the, hmm. in the winter. And then on Tuesday night, the city council would be fighting, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but you know what? I'm going to tell you. When it came to um, the city trying to get a huge, um, I can't remember. It was, was going to be a government, whether it was going to be an, it wasn't IRS, but it was something government that was going to bring 5,000, potentially 5,000 jobs to the city of Lowell, okay? Everybody got behind it because they knew they could put aside people who didn't talk to each other could put it aside because it was good for Lowell. And that's the key to that's kind of like Lowell is really good at that. I grew up in Salem. It had geography, it had history, it was, you know, but Lowell had its act together. When I went to Lowell, I had been once um, in my life before I started working there full time. And I was, I really admired the people of Lowell. And I really admire the people of Fitchburg. It's, the Lem Lemonster is a little better off than Fitchburg. Um, but I really, I hope there's some sort of grass, grassroots level. It's good to note that the Concord Bridge is gonna be a print and, mm -hmm. and online product. And she has a strategy for you know what she's going to print ahead and what she's what she's going to hold for the print and i think it's it sounded it sounded sound um and you know a lot of people used to come up to me in fitchburg and say oh you know i really love to hold the paper you know i know you're online but i really love to hold the paper in my hands and i said you know unfortunately people like you are showing up on my obituary page too much, you know, these days. And it would be like, they'd be like stunned, you know. Um, but that was the, that's the fact. And uh, we did everything to, to work on, on um, our digital stuff. We tried cool, we were doing drone stuff. We didn't, you know, you know, I remember Jim Campanini telling me, you know, you're supposed to have a license for that. And I said, oh, well, somebody, had, somebody, had, somebody, uh, somebody told me it's not, you know, it's not quite settled yet. So, you know, we kind of did it hoping we could just, uh, we could just, uh, rather than ask for permission, we would, we would uh, beg forgiveness if we ever got caught. But we were doing drone stuff. We had, we had one, we had, we had brought our page views up to 1.2 million per month at, at the uh, Central and Enterprise. And it was not just one thing. It was not just one thing. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I hope that there could be, and, you know, when I first heard about the government helping newspapers, I was dead against it. Mm -hmm. And then my colleague, um, Kevin Carragy, <laughs> who, who is a self-described anarchist, um, told me that he, that, that when the country first started, and they, first of all, these guys gave us the First Amendment, you know, we still have to, I tell my students, don't forget those guys in the powdered wigs, you know, because they gave you a really, really strong tool. Uh, but the government subsidized um, the, 
postage to get newspapers distributed. Right. So, so I'm not totally against it, I, but I think there have to be very clear firewall between the government and us, but how can you ever, with politics, how can you ever ensure that that firewall will be, um, will, would be observed? But um, I, hope that, I hope that communities, um, you know, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, some of these communities start in local neighborhoods, you know, just, just trying to uh, do that. But I, 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 I can't say. It, it, is, it is better for the deep, deep pockets, you know, uh, those communities with deep pockets. And... Uh, so maybe I need to send that guy another another email. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, can I just yeah, please do. one model that we haven't mentioned yet um, that sort of addresses this concern is the Report for America um, mm. operation. Yeah, Charlie with, Senate. With Charlie Senate, a former Globy, who. Um, um, who now has quite an operation. I, I don't have the numbers right at my fingertips, but it's in the hundreds of um, reporters who are trained. It's sort of like um, you know the teacher corps um, or what used to be the Peace Corps or VISTA, those kinds of things, um, who, who train reporters and send them into the communities where, um, you know, where, that are quite under-resourced and, and poorer places. And, and um, they go to work in existing publications in some of these um, much poorer communities. So there, there is something I just wanted That's to yeah. mention there. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Ellen and I, in traveling around the country to visit various news organizations, ran into Report for America um, core members mm -hmm. everywhere we went. They either were on the ground or they, the operation was in the process of hiring them. Uh, it's been a real boon to independent journalism. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned them. Uh, at this time, <laughs> why don't we move to audience questions? I'd love to know what's on your mind. And I'm not sure what the arrangement is, if there's a microphone that's going to be circulated around. Apparently. Or, there is indeed. There's one here and one over there. Okay, so come on up and ask your question. Hi, thank you so much for this uh, panel. Uh, David Yamad, I teach here at the law school, and I find myself thinking more and more as I get older in terms of generations, and I wanted to introduce that thought into the conversation, um, perhaps especially to Dan and Charles who are working with young folks in the classroom. Do you find that today's journalism students understand these changing models and the changing economics of the news business and do you find that they have the inclination to act in that sort of entrepreneurial way to try and be the the inheritors of what some of the grizzled veterans are doing you know as they leave the denver paper and try to pick up the pieces from other more traditional uh, uh newspapers that were bought out by these corporate conglomerates so you know what are your impressions of this gen y and gen z and can they be the ones to inherit what you folks have been trying to do to save local journalism well they're going to figure out better ways to than we did you know, to do it, I think. I'm, I'm very bullish on journalism and, uh, you know, having worked for the last five years full-time or four, four years full-time, um, you know, as the practitioner in residence here, um, I'm pretty confident that these kids can do. Um, and I always, they know. I, I taught issues in journalism um, I think my second year here, and I spent five weeks on this problem. I talked about news deserts and ghost newspapers. I talked about my experiences. I, I joke with my students now that I must sound like the ghost of newspapers past when I'm talking about how <laughs> the good old days, you know, which weren't always so good, you know. And, uh, I, you know, I'm confident in them. I still remain very bullish on journalism. Um, it, the best journalism I read in my life was in 2020 because journalists had to do their best work uh, since the beginning of man mm -hmm. and woman. So it, it, you know, they rise to the occasion and I believe that that will happen uh, with, with this generation. My biggest fear, you know, um, 
my biggest fear is apathy, is that they don't, you know, I make them read the news, you know, I give them quizzes, they hate me. But I, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta build a, a habit of reading news. I, my, my mother got two papers. She got, she got the, the morning Boston paper, and I don't want to identify it because there's a Boston Globe um, person sitting right next to me. And another one right directly in front of me, so she, yeah, the record American. Okay, you, you the Herald American. Uh, and, uh, but in the evening, we got the Salem News. You know, it was a second buy. We, the, when we were at the, the Salem News, uh, we saw, our, saw ourselves as the second buy because people didn't just get one newspaper, they got two. And my mother also got the Sunday, Lynn Sunday Post. It was about as wide as a, as a runway at, at Logan then, and it was great. She loved it. Did you want to take a shot? Dan, do you want to? You do more with journalism students, honestly. Okay. Um, well, you know, I would say I'm not only uh, a professor at Northeastern, but I was a journalism student there back in the 70s. And so that gives me kind of an interesting perspective on this. I, I will say that um, a large number of our journalism students have always gone into communications-related fields that are not directly journalism. And the reason for that is because uh, getting jobs in the news business has always been hard. Mm -hmm. It's harder now, but it was never easy. And so the students that we have today face challenges that I didn't have, but nevertheless, we had challenges too, and I, I try to stress that to them. Uh, we have students who are working at some remarkable jobs at you know, recent graduates, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Um, we had, uh, we still have somebody at BuzzFeed, although they keep laying people off, uh, Politico. Uh, so they've really done very well. Um, what I worry about is, well, maybe I shouldn't be that worried. I'm going to say, I don't see that they have a tremendous interest in doing community journalism. They really want to get up more to that national level. Uh, but as I said, maybe I shouldn't be that worried about that because what are we talking about here? We're talking about the decline of jobs in community journalism. So if they're able to make the leap to something national uh, fairly quickly, that's probably to their good. Uh, I just wish that there were jobs at the community journalism level that they could go into, that they paid enough to make a living, and that they were excited about doing that. But that's really not the situation we're in at the moment. Thank you very much. And please just keep raising this message. I, I think the stakes are so dire in so many ways. And so as I've told Dan, we're friends on Facebook. You know, this is great work that you're doing because... Uh, Boy, if you've ever spent time in a place that doesn't have a, an investigative news presence, you, you see what happens to the community. It really makes a difference. So thanks again. No, you go first. Oh, okay. um, hi, I'm Adam. I'm uh, the director of community engagement here at Suffolk. And um, I want to pick up on kind of follow up on the last question as well about the generational differences. And, you know, one of the things in our work that we try to do is we try to get students involved in the local community. And it's just, it's a whole lot. We, we run local programs and national and, and international programs. And boy, the national and international programs are way sexier than the programs that, that get students in Roxbury or, yeah. you know, kind of right down the road. Um, and I, while I appreciate the optimism about the next generation, I do, I am very concerned about the lack of interest in what's happening right outside versus what seems to be more exciting down, you know, across the world or, or you know, students will get really excited about LGBTQ rights in Moscow, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a 29% turnout rate in the mayoral race when it's an historic uh, mayoral race where it's the first woman of color was going to be elected. So I'm just curious about like what, what we can do to make the local more exciting, more interesting, more engaging. And, um, from your perspective, well, I've tried and, um, I've, I've, I've changed my, a lot of my assignments. Um, I've broadened my assignments, you know, for me, it was like, you know, I, I try to get them covering elections and, 
and things like local elections, um, you know, assignments like that. Um, I, but I've, we, you know, part of the CJN media um, mission is social justice. And really, journalism is all about social justice. We're always fighting. You know, we, we, we aff what is it, afflict the, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Um, and, and so this is part of, so if, if you know, I've, I've said, I've broadened kind of, kind of these assignments. Hey, find a nonprofit who's doing some great work in a, in a neighborhood that you might be nervous walking through, you know, things like that. Go cover people that aren't getting covered, you know. Um, and, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to do is just saying, you know, is it, um, is it my, is, is my 1980s, you know, thought about what is news? accurate anymore, you know, so I'm always trying to change it. Um, but it's really important that they understand, uh, you know, part of it is getting people's, getting other people in leadership positions. So there's still, elections are still important, things like that. You, you know, there's a chicken and egg problem. Uh, earlier this year, when Gannett announced that they were going to eliminate local reporting in their weekly newspapers and moved to regional beats. Uh, I obtained a memo um, from uh, and a Gannett executive who said, our readers don't care about local news. Our metrics show that. And my first thought was, how would you know? Right. You've never tried. Uh, or, or I shouldn't say you've never tried. You haven't tried in recent years uh, to provide your community with local news. Uh, so I think that I think that when young people are exposed to it, uh, they find that it can be uh, pretty cool and interesting. You know, when I was a reporter in the 80s at the Daily Times Chronicle in Woburn, uh, one of the things I actually loved about that job is that it was really the only time in my career where I was reporting news that no one else was reporting, even just routine news. But they were totally dependent on me, and I knew I had to be accurate and fair and, and all of those good things. Um, last year, when I was making the rounds and, and made a couple of trips to New Haven, uh, I interviewed a couple of extremely young staff reporters for the New Haven Independent. Uh, I mean, everybody's young compared to me, but these were young women who were maybe 21, 22 years old. They just loved what they were doing. Well, why not? They were getting great mentoring. The independent pays a living wage. Uh, it was an ideal situation. And as a result, both of these young women had fallen in love with local news. And I think that they're going to try to find a way to continue to do that throughout their careers. But we don't have enough opportunities in situations like that, unfortunately. Yeah, I, you know, I would agree and say you just have to do it to see how satisfying it is. I mean, I, I, when I ran this little East Boston Community News, I lived in the community. There was nothing more satisfying than writing a story about some abandoned lot full of trash, you know, chasing down the owner of the property in Florida, having, you know, embarrassing him into coming back and cleaning the thing up and having a little community celebration because of, of your reporting. I mean, there's nothing like it. Mm. Um, and, you know, you live in the community, you, you breathe it, you, you, uh, you know, come to love it, but you have to, you have to do it to see um, how satisfying it is. It's absolutely sexier, you know, easier in a, in a lot of ways to cover national, um, national issues. Um, you know, you, you get somebody's name spelled wrong in your neighborhood in a local paper and you will hear about it. Mm. Um, it's very humbling. Um, and it's a great experience because of that. Um, whereas if, you know, you spell somebody's name wrong as a senator or whatever, uh, you know, they'll survive. So, uh, you know, I think that I'm just echoing really what Dan had to say, which is that you're not, we need to provide these opportunities either through school programs or other the report from America, whatever it is, um, to, just to help people understand how um, incredibly rewarding it is. Um, so uh, as a uh, community journalist myself, uh, 
we used to um, make fun of USA Today mm. uh, for being so short, and at the time it was um, considered sort of uh, not cool uh, among journalists that USA Today was taking important stories and writing them in 150 word stories. Uh, but eventually, we all sort of said, yeah, I mean, that, that was happening, and that's OK. And so the question is, um, since we are in a uh, situation now with uh, TikTok and Twitter and a ton of different social media outlets, um, and that is how uh, people, uh, young people, uh, but also middle-aged folks, too, are getting a lot of information. Uh, whether we need to be talking about giving in and communicating that way more and figuring out how to do it and not being so, you know, just, we were all just the facts. Like, let's tell people the facts. But it seems like uh, news with attitude and news with good visuals and news with memes and other types of news um, is really what, young people are going to read, and so trying to uh, address that and be more honest about this sort of where people really are at. Hmm. Yeah, the Washington Post is doing a lot, of, a lot on TikTok, and it's, some of it, I don't, it's, I don't get it, but maybe others, <laughs> others do. Um, it's speaking a whole new language, and, uh, but, you know, we, we, we have to be careful. I think newspapers are being, uh, you know, very, I always, you know, I teach d a digital nonfiction storytelling. And um, I always say, when, you know, when you get hired by a, you know, make sure, ask them what their social media policy is. Make sure that, the, that it's, and if they don't have one, you know, make them develop one or, you know, um, so that, you know, you know how you should be conducting yourself on uh, social media. I mean, it's it's common. It's a lot of common sense. But I've noticed that the New York Times had a social media policy. I think they just recently might have updated it. Mm -hmm. Women journalists are being um, are, are more more uh, more often are targets right. of trolls, etc., than male journalists. And it's just, you know, it's like the, uh, you know, it's like the schoolyard bullies are out, you know. And um, so, um, and I think news organizations are recognizing that problem and they're standing up for their reporters on social media uh, more often. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still very, very much a shifting thing. Um, the Globe, I, I would assume, has a, has a social media policy. I'm assuming. You know, I haven't it? read it. Do myself. you follow it? I, I have. I'm. I'm very. I have a very low profile on social okay. media. Yeah. I, I have a Twitter account, and that's it. Um, and I only do it. I only sort of post my my uh, my writing there. Um, but you know, I think there's two things that that you're talking about. One is using the sort of the techniques or the attractive aspects of TikTok and Instagram and so on by you know, sort of mainstream or what do you want to call legacy media uh, or more traditional media outlets. The other is like, like wading right in there um, and getting on TikTok and getting on Instagram by these, by these um, you know, more traditional news operations. And it's sort of two different things. Um, I think that you know, it, it, what they could be useful for and I'm, I'm sort of thinking this through right now at the top of my head. So what they could be useful for is a kind of, to sort of introduce a younger generation to the more, um, you know, the longer and more deeply analyzed news stories from those publications, kind of a gateway drug <laughs> to, to like legitimate newspapers or to legitimate news. Um, because the, the, those platforms themselves are, are so, can be so, um, you know, it's like walking into a bar room where there's a big brawl going on and your chairs are flying and like, why would you want to go into that bar? Right, you know, really. Right. Um, so you have to you have to carefully choose, um, you know, where you uh, bring your business. But I, I do think they that you know we need to recognize where the readers are of that generation and and bring our work to them. 
So I think you have some good points there. I'll just add that a lot of local newspapers, before they get on TikTok, should make sure that their websites are readable. Mm -hmm. um, the auto plague videos and the ads that cover the screen, the mm -hmm. complete lack of a mobile experience. I think one of the most valuable things we could do for the future of local news is invest in a web design that you know the New York Times can afford and mm -hmm. the Washington Post can afford that makes people able to and interested in reading their local newspapers on a device that they use for their news because right now it's I don't I don't like it I study local news yeah, and I yeah. don't want I don't want yeah. auto plays I don't want pop-ups I don't want you know I don't want the experience that I'm getting from them and so That's let's let's invest in infrastructure we do it you know we talk about roads and bridges this is the roads and bridges of local news get a web design that people can take off the shelf and helps people read your product you make a really good point, Josh, yeah. and uh, one of the things that mystifies me is that we all understand in the news business now that um, page views, clicks, unique visitors are all fairly worthless metrics. What really matters is developing an engaged audience that's willing to uh, toss you some money every month. And how we think that anybody is going to subscribe to our products when we make it so difficult to use them is, is really beyond me. And you, I also agree with you about the lack of standardization. I mean, you, go to, you get a print newspaper, yeah, they're, they're all pretty much the same size. Mm -hmm. uh, they're laid out in roughly the same way. I mean, these are standards that you know, we've grown accustomed to and we're very comfortable with them. And yet it seems like every news website is recreated from scratch yeah. and many of them are just terrible. Yeah. Really good point, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I am somebody who has um, intentionally lived in a cave for quite some time and I think it stemmed from the want to not be exposed to news not only because of the weight of it I think in recent times obviously it's very heavy and there's been a lot of things that have gone on but also because I felt like it was very difficult to find actually balanced news and I felt like especially living in Massachusetts where there's a very large majority that is always kind of you know swaying one way I just felt it was impossible to find local news that was actually truly non-biased. And I'm just wondering like, what you would think about that if you, if you feel that that might even be true or not, or and if, if so, how we, how we fix it. Hmm. Dan, you should take that, I think, because John, John Keller was, you and John Keller talked about this. Uh, yes, John and I WBC talked about this quite a bit. Sunday morning, I think. Um, yeah. Um, I would, you know, rather than try to dive right into an answer, I'd like to ask you to expand on that a little bit and tell me what you mean. Sure, and please go back to the mic. I, I don't hear well anyway. Usually pretty loud. Um, you know, I just, I just, you know, I think it's obvious in national news, like if I'm gonna go listen to Fox, I understand the lens I have to listen to it through, right? If I go listen to CNN, I know the lens I'm gonna be listening to it from. And I feel like with local news, there's, it's so few and far between that oftentimes I'm not sure what I'm getting. Huh. Like, and, and I, I sometimes do feel like it's swaying in one direction or the other and that I'm not getting the, the full truth. Hmm. Does that help? Okay, sure. Hmm. Um, well, you know, when it comes to regional and local news, I mean, my sense is that the major news organizations that you would be depending on here uh, which would be, you know, the Globe, the public radio stations, the TV stations. They are, they may be broadly liberal in their outlook. I don't think there's really much doubt about that. Um, but I do think that they are dedicated to a fair-minded pursuit of the truth and that they really do their best in, in reporting that truth. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, there are people who think that, um, well, this is, there's a lot of liberal bias here, and I'm really not interested in it. And unfortunately, we really don't have much of a conservative alternative uh, in Massachusetts since uh, the Boston Herald began sliding a number of years ago. So I, I, I'm not sure what more to say about it than that. Thank you.
So, oh, okay, I was going to, please. My question is, is, I guess, following up on a lot of these things, and it's more on developing a readership. I mean, thank you for it restoring my faith in the fact that there are hungry young journalists who are going to be interested in covering local stories, but how do you interest a generation of readers, or two generations of readers, who have not been acclimated to paying attention to that, to that local news? And this is a more direct question, and I asked Marty Barron this when he was at the Washington Post. I was like, it's way too expensive. Like, my students can't afford it. I'm pointing you out. Cam was excited because for some reason Shaw's is sending him a $10 coupon every Thursday. So a subscription to the Boston Globe, not going to happen. So what's the responsibility, I think, of the more successful outlets that are out there to start developing readers by providing free access to public high schools? Mm -hmm. Certainly to colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. I guess that's my, it's a little that bit. That might be next right? year's panel, I think. Uh, <laughs> and that's tough. And it's, you know, I do it, I do it by bribery. I, they want A's and, and they have to take my news quizzes, you know. Uh, um, and they, and well, you know, you know, I, I'm not sure what the answer is to that. I was worried about apathy when Patch first started in Chelmsford and, and someone said, what are you, are you worried about Patch? I said, I'm worried about apathy. I'm wor worried about people just moving away from the news as it is. And this whole polarization doesn't help. Evidence of it right here, sitting right here. She went, no, see you later. I'm not gonna have it. Um, so I'm not sure what the answer is, but you know, you start by trying to teach your students about writing the truth and, and seeing the tr you know, seeking the truth and, you know, this whole thing, bo both sidesism and um, whatnot, you know. What's the truth? You know, I have a thing on my, one of my colleagues whom I had a prof for a professor, Deb Geisler, when I was a student here. Uh, it says, you know, if, if someone tells you it's raining outside and someone tells you it's sunny outside, you know, you don't just put that in the paper. You look out the freaking window, and I'm 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 making it uh, PG. Um, yes, I have that meme on my computer. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it is and, not freaking. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, and and tell me what what it is. What's the truth about it? You know, who's right? You know, so that's our obligation. The truth. We we always talk about it, but yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, I know. Yeah. But, but why should they care? Right. And now, how do you get them to care? So I was at the Boston Globe for 25 years, maybe longer, actually. Um, and, you know, and when I became a senior editor, I would go to these meetings where we would, we would like, wring our hands about how do we get the younger generation of readers uh, to read the Boston Globe. Those, those 18 to 34-year-olds we were worried about then are, you know, applying for Social Security now, okay? That's how long this problem has been going on in, in journalism. So what, what happens is that people get married, buy homes, have children, get involved in their local schools. That's when they start caring about the local news. Um, and this has been true for, you know, really for generations. And so there's that piece of it. But I think you're talking about something else really important, which is the, the cost to entry for somebody to pick up a, a copy of, the, you know, the Boston Globe's 250 a day, and, you know, is it really that great a bargain, you know? It's Whatever three, it is $3. now, I mean, I subscribe every day, so it's $1,000, I think it is, for the annual subscription. So it's, it is wicked expensive. The, the New York Times does have a newspaper in the classroom program that, you know, starts in the K through 12 grades and, you know, gets young people into the habit of reading the news. It's um, a excuse me? It's a gateway drug. Yeah. E exactly. We had a newspaper and education program, NIE. Uh, yeah. They have conventions and all that. And I'm, I can't believe that, that they ha still have that program that, at, at the Sentinel and Enterprise and at the Lowell Sun. I, yeah. I, I don't, I think they've been cut. Yeah, so when I first started teaching, the Globe would 
dumped stacks of Boston Globes at okay. various College places campuses. on campus. Yeah. And you could just grab it for free. And, you know, I would tell my students, grab a globe. We're going to talk about some of the, the, the coverage in class. Uh, the problem is even papers that are doing fairly well, uh, their margin, with the possible exception of the New York Times, uh, they're marginal businesses. And I think that when you say, well, you really need to start um, giving it away to young readers or something like that in order to improve, to improve access, they get their backs up because, you know, it's only very recently that they got back up on their feet financially, and now they're being told, well, you should start giving it to some people. And I get that we are cutting out um, younger people by charging uh, a lot of money, but I'm not really quite sure what the alternative is. I will say that in Boston, there's plenty of good free sources of news. I mean, there's the two public radio stations, Commonwealth Magazine, uh, the TV stations. Um, you can't beat the globe for the type of comprehensive accountability journalism that it does, uh, but these other news outlets are doing a fine job and you don't have to pay for any of them. I tell my students that Boston is a great place to learn journalism. There is, a, you know, not one but two public tele, uh, public uh, radio uh, stations. It's, it's. Yeah. I said it's really, it's really great. You know, it is really a conundrum because you know it's expensive to sue the Pentagon. It's expensive to um, dedicate five reporters full time for one year investigating uh, sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. I mean, how much do you think that cost? Not to mention the lawyer's fees and everything else. And, you know, frankly, I'm not sure whether the Boston Globe could have done that spotlight report on, on the Catholic Church today, um, whether it would have the resources. I mean, I, Ellen might know better than I. Um, I, I you know, I hope so, so it, it's, it's a very expensive enterprise. And journalism is an expensive thing. It's not even just the physical paper that we're talking about, you know, which and the costs of printing and the trucks and the delivery. The actual journalism is labor intensive and people cost money. If you want quality, you know, you're gonna have to pay for it. So I don't know what the answer is to this. I wish there were, you know, an easy one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's in a little, in a way, that's what we have now because only the people who can afford it are actually <laughs> getting the home delivery. Uh, so, but but it does cut out a lot of people. Even the online is is expensive for some. I'm I'm not here to to tout the Boston Globe, but I will point out that uh, a digital only subscription is a buck a day. And if you go back and compare that to putting a quarter in the news box every morning, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, it doesn't seem to me that um, it's really become uh, that much more expensive unless you want to get that extremely expensive print edition, which uh, we've actually given up in our household because of the expense. We just uh, read, the, read the digital edition now. You know, I have a question I wanted to ask my, fe my fellow panelists here. Um, we were talking a little earlier about different types of government regulation that, mm. that might come into effect, different types of laws. One of the things I've wondered about for a long time is why we as a society allow corporate chains and hedge funds to come in and destroy the journalism in our communities. You have this completely random situation where we have an independently owned daily paper in Boston that's, that's doing fairly well, and then Alden Global Capital comes in and buys the Chicago Tribune and starts selling it off of parts. Um, it, would it be possible, do you think, to have some type of legislation that would essentially require these corporate-owned newspapers to uh, sell to qualified local groups if there is such a group, and if they refuse to do it, to have some sort of a tax penalty or something like that. Does, does that make sense to you? 
I like it. Um, the it, it's it's a good point. You know, Westford was able to you know, 30 years ago they were able to get keep Walmart out of town, mm. right? But you know they let every you know every other every other business in, but uh, they kept Walmart out. But if if someone came in, you don't know. It's like you know it's the frog in the water. Still, it's you don't know that they're going to come in. They always pledge to you know that their 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 websites say how serious they are about preserving journalism. And uh, you Nothing know will change. when you look under the hood, it's it's a whole different uh, thing. I've gone from frogs to hoods, but you know you get it. So I, I, mixed you know, metaphors. I don't think your idea is possible. I mean, it's capitalism, baby. I don't see um, how you know government regulation of any industry, particularly one as sensitive as um, you know. I, I understand that you're making an argument that precisely because it's so sensitive, we should be able to have some protections. But um, I just don't see it happening. But there, there were local ownership rules. There were rules about how many different play, uh, news sources within a market. Right. You could, and then and, and they then, were thrown they out. Got thrown out. Because so. the Supreme Court said that this, these were violations of right. speech. Right. So, so we sort of tried that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And and subsidies to local news has always been there. It's always it's fundamental, as you noted, to to the survival of it. And people don't want government involved in their news, but. To deny that is to say that gas and milk cost what you think they cost, mm -hmm. and they don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they don't at all. So what, what do those subsidies look like? How do uh, politicians and, and government make sure that uh, local newspapers can survive? They, it's changed across time. It used to be exceptions to child labor laws to make sure that kids on bicycles could throw their your newspaper at you in the morning. Right. right? So it, it just depends on the time. And if we can't adapt from a policy perspective to what these times need, and maybe that is cutting off the vampire squid at the head, um, then then we're not then local news won't operate as it always has, which is as a subsidized product. So in the interest of time, I want to mm -hmm. invite us all uh, to uh, to uh, embark for our, our reception. Um, so I want to thank our wonderful panel uh, today uh, for these great remarks, for this great conversation, uh, you and the audience for these great questions. Um, I want to again thank um, Ed and Seidel Masterman um, for their support of the Masterman Lecture Series. Um, some of the folks at the law school who did tremendous work um, organizing today, uh, Michael Fish, Kara Ryan, um, Jenny DeLisi of University Media Services, uh, Susan Spurlick of the Ford Hall Forum, um, and WGBH Forums as well for um, recording and, uh, and webcasting our, uh, our presentation today. Um, so I invite you all uh, to join us and to also give a, a round of applause to our uh, panel.